Grace and peace to you in the name of God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and in whose spirit we worship this morning. The Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome to worship at Zion Methodist Church of Gordonville. I'm your pastor, Scott Griffin. Always delight to be in worship with you and see, see many of you. Some of you weren't here last week and uh, some of you aren't here this week and you're watching us online. Welcome to worship. Even if you're wash, watching from home or a delayed time, we welcome you to worship. It's deer season and it shows around here and we have some people who are gone, but we're worshiping the Lord anyway and glad to welcome you in whenever you can worship with us. Going to be doing some new things, some different things this morning, but before we get there, let me talk to you about some of the announcements. If you're to open your bulletin and you're in-house, you'll find your Welcome to Worship card. In this service, even though we'll be having some communion, you will still fill out that Welcome to Worship card and the offering plate will be passed to you, just like we would in a, in a regular service without communion. So do fill that out, give us a record of your attendance, and if you're worshiping online, you can welcome, be welcome to worship and, and respond online. We'd love to have you check into Zion that way. A few other announcements. This is an altar rail offering going to uh, Jackson Public School uh, Children's Fund. So excited about that. Uh, if you weren't here last week and still want to give to that, you can this week through the altar rail offering. Um, although we won't be coming to the rail this morning. It'll be a little bit different. So just tune in. Keep, keep staying tuned in so that you know what's going on throughout the service. It's going to be a little different today. There is information in the lobby about Orphan Sunday. I hope that you saw it there, and in a moment we'll have a video about Orphan Sunday. Today is Orphan Sunday around the world, and uh, we have a, a new venture that we've engaged over the past several months. Lori Holt came in, was a speaker here for Strong Tower Haiti, and that is an orphanage that is in uh, Caracol, Haiti, and uh, I've been in, involved with that ministry through Lori uh, since 2017. And so it's something that our ZMW here, the Zion Methodist Women, are going to be working on and working with over the coming months. And, and this, there is an announcement in there talking about all women are invited to join them for a time of reflection and thanksgiving at their next meeting, which is tomorrow, November 13th. And this, uh, this organization will receive the, their thank offering will go to Strong Tower Haiti. So what is it? Well, that's what this next video will talk to us about. Mostly what we're looking to do uh, this year is to just have this on the top of our minds for next year. So it, it'll ask you a question, and hopefully we'll reflect on that question over the course of the next year. Let's take a look at what this uh, venture is about, this opportunity to give in new ways. Sing to God, sing in praise of His name. Extol Him who rides on the clouds. Rejoice before Him, His name is the Lord. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. Psalm 68, verses 4 through 6. Strong Tower Haiti is a nonprofit organization that partners with the local Church of the Redeemer in Caracol, Haiti. Strong Tower Haiti exists to assist those partners to care for vulnerable children and families in their community. Through residential care and initiatives that strengthen families, Strong Tower seeks to help prevent children from becoming orphans. Programs such as long-term care, family strengthening classes and resources, microfinancing and a school lunch program all help to support families who are working hard to stay together. Learn more about Strong Tower Haiti and how you can care for the vulnerable of Caracol by visiting strongtowerhaiti.com. Everyone can do something. What's your something? And that's the question I hope we have in our hearts and minds over the course of the next year. What's your something? Last week we had in the bulletin um, a handout that talked about four different ways to be involved, and that's something. And you can figure that out uh, through that handout and strongtowerhaiti.com. It's a pretty neat organization. One of the things that the video said that I want to lift up is interesting. Helping children not become orphans. Well, how can you, most of the time we think about orphans as people who don't have parents, their earthly parents aren't living anymore. How can you keep people alive and you don't know what's going to happen? In third world countries, it's not only, it doesn't only occur that way. Sometimes if they can't provide for their children, they will send them to an orphanage because they can't provide. So they help families take care of each other and give them ways to continue to maintain their family uh, status and, and work together and live together continually. So that's one of the things that Strong Tower Haiti does, not just being there for those who are orphaned, but being there for families so that it doesn't happen. Pretty special ministry that we can participate in. A few other announcements for you. There's an all-church Thanksgiving dinner 
that I will admit I didn't do a very good job of announcing last week. So this week, I'm making it up for it. We're having an all-church Thanksgiving dinner next Sunday. There's a sign-up in the lobby. Please do sign up to participate in some way. If you're inclined, you want to be a part, that'll be noon next Sunday, a Thanksgiving dinner for us as a church. Look forward to fellowshipping with you all there. That about covers it for our announcements, other than one special announcement that I'm going to do after the choir. So if the choir will come forward, they will ring us into worship this morning. As they do, they'll be singing for us. What a friend we have in Jesus.
Thank you so much, choir. Wonderful job. What a beautiful way to ring us into worship. As you return to your seats, you might not hurry to sit down because I'm going to invite everyone else other than our veterans to stand. Often during veterans season when we recognize our veterans, we have them stand. But we're going to stand and we're going to recognize them by giving them a round of applause. Would you stand and thank our veterans this morning? We thank you so much for your service, your kind service. Everybody can remain standing because we're going to invite them now to stand with us as we offer our uh, call to worship, our scriptural call to worship from the book of Psalms. We do thank you, though, for your service, for all that you've done for this country and your willingness to serve and, and sacrifice even your life. Thank you so much. And at this time, let us uh, recite words from the psalmist. 116 with our liturgist, Cindy Rogers, this morning. I love the Lord because he hears my voice and my prayer for mercy. Because he bends down to listen, I will pray as long as I have breath. Death wrapped its ropes around me. The terrors of the grave overtook me. I saw only trouble and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Please, Lord, save me. How kind the Lord is, how good he is. So merciful, this God of ours. The Lord protects those of childlike faith. He has saved me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. And so I walk in the Lord's presence as I live here on earth. What can I offer the Lord for all he has done for me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and praise the Lord's name for saving me. I will keep my promises to the Lord in the presence of all his people. I will offer you a sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the house of the Lord, in the heart of Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is the story of who our God is. And as the band comes forward to lead us in a few songs, we're going to talk, uh, sing together, and we'll remain standing. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus connects us to this great and mighty God, this merciful and uh, God that we give so much thanksgiving for, all the things that he does in our life. Let us lift our voices together.
as we uh, sing of God's greatness to us, all the wonderful things that he offers, we are delighted. But at this time, we're going to move into a time of prayer. We're going to sing this hymn, this chorus found in our hymnals. Fill my cup, Lord. We'll sing it two times through. Let us prepare our hearts to offer all that we are to the Lord this morning. Fill us up and make us whole. For we know that each day that we live without you or from the last time that we've been in contact with you, we become more and more empty. So we come to receive from you, O Lord, today. Wherever we find ourselves, whatever's going on in our hearts and our minds, maybe there are things that are troubling us. Maybe through the choir singing and through the songs that we've sung, our, our minds still aren't attuned to you yet this morning. I pray that they are and they have been. Scripture has been read. What a glory this morning has already been. But sometimes, God, life troubles us, and we're just, we're just not present with you. We desire that you do exactly as that song said and fill our cup. We want to go into this world in the strength of your Spirit, not, not just trying to get by, but enthused for the world and the life that you have us lead and the life that we're supposed to live for you. We know as we live our life for you, we are at our best. God, bring us our best this morning. Offer it to us. Let us receive it and walk forward in strength in your will as we lead from this place. God, we pray for those whose names are listed in our bulletin. Some are there, some aren't. There are concerns I've heard about even this day, quite a few actually, that aren't in the bulletin and maybe won't ever be there, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a need, that there isn't a balm from heaven that can salve their wounds, their concerns, wounds of body, wounds of heart and mind. God, would you touch each one directly at the point of need that we would come away from our time with you knowing that we have been with the Master, the Creator God, the Almighty God, the God of all comfort, we place our hands, ourselves in your hands, and we pray that you would give us exactly what we need. Lord, we desire to be your people and to be obedient to you, so as we offer you these things, which you want us to do, you want us to come and, and be with you in prayer and offer these, all that we are to you, we also offer to you the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning our Old Testament reading comes from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31. And our liturgist this morning, Cindy Rogers, will read us just a few verses. The day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant though I love them as a husband loves his wife, says the Lord. 
But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them, and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. And they will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, You should know the Lord. For everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already, says the Lord, and I will forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins. The word of the Lord. This word of God is about a new covenant, a new covenant which we get to celebrate whenever we do communion, and we're going to be doing it again this morning, celebrating this new covenant where God never again remembers our sins. This morning, we're going to offer Come Sinners to the Gospel Feast. This is one of the many hymns that Charles Wesley wrote on communion. We don't often sing all of these hymns. Sometimes they're The tunes are harder than others. Sometimes the words are unfamiliar. But there's so much that Methodism has offered in this area right around communion we want to offer it this morning. Let us lift our voices. Come sinners to the gospel feast. singing along. At this time, if the uh, ushers would prepare themselves, we'll gather together God's tithes and our offerings. And as they do, we'll remember that uh, in this time, God only offers, uh, asks us to offer back a portion of what he's given us, just a small portion in order to move his kingdom forward. He takes what we give and multiplies it. He increases what we give away. And because he does that and because you participate in that, I pray that the Lord continues to bless you as you give.
remain standing for our New Testament reading, coming from 1 Corinthians 11. Our uh, liturgist this morning, Cindy Rogers, will read us verses 17 through 34. But in the following instructions, I cannot praise you, for it sounds as if more harm than good is done when you meet together. First, I hear that there are divisions among you when you meet as a church, and to some extent, I believe it. But, of course, there must be divisions among you so that you who have God's approval will be recognized. When you meet together, you are not really interested in the Lord's Supper. For some of you hurry to eat your own meal without sharing with others. As a result, some go hungry while others get drunk. What? Don't you have your own homes for eating and drinking? Or do you really want to disgrace God's church and shame the poor? What am I supposed to say? Do you want me to praise you? Well, I certainly will not praise you for this. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That is why many of you are weak and sick, and some have even died. But if we would examine ourselves, we would not be judged by God in this way. Yet when we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So my dear brothers and sisters, when you gather for the Lord's Supper, wait for each other. If you are really hungry, eat at home so you won't bring judgment upon yourselves when you meet together. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated at this time as the children's sermon is about to begin. Donna Take will come forward and offer that children's sermon if the children will come down and meet her. Okay, this is much better. Thank you. Welcome. It's so great to see everybody. Okay, so today we're going to talk about a word that you hear a lot at church, but it's really hard to understand what it means. We're going to talk about the word grace. And it is, if you were to ask everyone in this room, most people would have maybe a hard time telling you exactly what it means. It's a very important word. We talk about, uh, Pastor Scott's been having a sermon series called Means of Grace, but what does that mean exactly? So, Here's my story. Let's say, well, let me ask you, how many of you have spelling tests at school? Okay, and so how does that work? Does a teacher send you a list of words home at the beginning of the week, right? And then you study those words, and then you take a test. Is that how it goes? Okay, so let's say that you, um, well, let me ask you, how, how do you guys do on those tests? 
How do you do on your spelling test? Um, you do pretty good, or how do you do? Do you like spelling? Yes. Yes, you do. How do you do on your spelling test? Um, I do good, and I try my best. She does good, and she tries her best. That's going to add into the story. Perfect. Okay, so let's say one week you had spelling words, and you ignored them, like you did not study at all. And you go to school, and you take the test, and what do you think is going to happen? You'll get an F. Yep. So what happens if the teacher says, oh, that's not how you usually do. You usually do so much better. Let me give you a second chance. So let me send the same words home with you again this week. And this time you studied really hard because you kind of found out the consequence, right, of not studying as you get an F. So the second time you study really hard and you got 100%. You did great. That is a ex uh, kind of an example of God's grace. Because what God does is he gives us second chances. Sometimes we don't always say the right thing or do the right thing, or sometimes we make a mistake, and God will say, I know you can do better. I'm going to give you another chance. And that is kind of the, the easiest way to think about God's grace. It's a wonderful thing. We are very blessed that God loves us so much that he gives us second chances. So now my two helpers, if you'll come over here. Okay, so now we have two kinds of candy to pass out to kind of help you remember this. We have one that's, go ahead, look it up. We have one that's chocolate and one that is <laughs> kind of sour. So which one do you want to pick? Help like this. Layton, come on, come on down and have everybody pick out. Which one do you want? Do you want a sweet chocolate or do you want a sour piece of candy? You can make a choice. <clears throat> so if you pick a sweet chocolate, what I want you to do this week when you eat that chocolate is to think about how sweet life is because of God's grace, because God gives you second chances. If you pick the sour one, then when you eat it, I want you to think about how hard life would be, how sour it is in life without God giving us second chances. Okay, thank you, helpers. Can we say a quick prayer? Did you get one? <laughs> okay, let's say a quick prayer. Ready? Dear God, thank you for your amazing grace. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. It occurred to me, I'm going to get you in trouble now. Uh, it occurred to me to say, what if you made the wrong choice in the candy option? Do I get a second chance? <laughs> yeah. Could have been here all week, though, at that point. This morning, we are in the fourth of five sermons in a series on the means of grace. Uh, means of grace. These are ways in which the founder of Methodism, John Wesley, found God's grace is reliably conveyed to us, just as reliable as Donna's helpers were to pass out candy. God's grace is reliable in these ways. In John's own sermon entitled, The Means of Grace, Wesley delineated three of these means quite straightforwardly. As you may have seen in, in previous sermons like this next slide, Wesley said, first, all who desire the grace of God are to wait for it in the way of prayer. Then later in that same sermon, he added, secondly, all who desire the grace of God are to wait for it in searching the scriptures. Today, we note that he said, thirdly, all who desire an increase of the grace of God are to wait for it in partaking of the Lord's Supper. Now, while Wesley added at least two more means, those of Christian conferencing and, and fasting, these first three were originally mentioned in his sermon on the subject. And some of you may be wondering this morning, if these were the first three Wesley mentioned, why are we talking about the third one in his sermon 
the third one of receiving communion, on the fourth week of the sermon series. And why is the order on the screen different even from that? Pastor Scott, you've got all these out of order. What is going on here? Well, on that score, I appeal to the words of John Wesley himself, who said, we find no command in Holy Writ for any particular order to be observed herein. (laughs) So I can do it in any order I want. Well, while that's true, the fact is there's been a number of practical things happening. When God led me into an understanding of preaching on the means of grace, he didn't lead me to the calendar next. So a few things were going on in the life of the church. For example, last week, I thought it would make most sense to come back from annual conference and talk about Christian conferencing. The fact is Christian conferencing is mostly class meetings and bands, but we'd already heard about all of that, and I knew that some of us would be curious of what happened at our convening annual conference, so I decided to move that sermon to that Sunday. The problem was it was the first Sunday of the month, but I'd already promised that we would be doing in a one worship service communion on that day. So where do I put receiving communion? Well, as far as that goes, uh, then I was left with a few other Sundays. Next Sunday, I'll be preaching on Thanksgiving. It's the Sunday before Thanksgiving because the fifth sermon in the series is on fasting, and that's not a very good idea to do before Thanksgiving. So things had to move around. So there were some practical, functional reasons why things would be different. But not only that, what John Wesley has to say about communion, what he believed and what he practiced is why we're having communion again today. We'll get to more of that in a second. But his quote wasn't finished. There is no command for a direct order. But then he continues, in the meantime, the sure and general rule for all who groan for salvation of God is this, whenever opportunity serves, use all the means which God has ordained. In that regard, receiving communion, the sacrament of holy communion, is the receiving of the means of grace which sustains and nourishes us in our journey of salvation. Wesley wrote, the grace of God given herein confirms to us the pardon of our sins by enabling us to leave them. Have you ever considered that before about communion, about the elements that you are nourished of God to be able to walk away from the sins in which you ask for forgiveness? This is the food of our souls. This gives strength to perform our duty and leads us on to perfection. Both of the Wesleys, John and his hymn writer brother Charles, recognize the power of God available in the Lord's Supper and urge their followers to draw on that power by frequent participation. John Wesley described the Lord's Supper as the grand channel whereby the grace of the Holy Spirit was conveyed to the souls of all the children of God. They both understood that the grace available in and through the sacrament was active in conviction, that the grace of God was active through the sacrament in in repentance and conversion, in forgiveness, and in sanctification. This is one reason why in his 1784 letter to American Methodists, Wesley counseled, I also advise the elders to administer the supper of the Lord on every Lord's day. And during those years in which Methodism was beginning and growing, Wesley himself communed an average of four to five times a week. Now, some of you thought I was going to say a month, like once a week, and there's five Sundays sometimes, four to five times a month, four to five times a week. To Methodists today, this could seem strange, unnecessary, even boring and irrelevant. But what Methodists have long believed, which is shared with the heritage of all the church and church history before Methodism, is that something mysterious, something beyond our conscious engagement takes place as we partake the sacrament. What may help us understand this is that the Greek word used in the early church for sacrament was mysterion, usually translated mystery. This is where we derive our phrase in in the communion liturgy where the pastor requests that we proclaim the mystery of faith and then we respond with Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. This every communion litany, this word and response, reminds us that through sacraments, God discloses things that are beyond our human capacity to know through reason alone. Now, I want to be clear we understand something here. This mystery isn't something that we wait to understand, like at the conclusion of a Scooby-Doo episode. You know, most television shows are 22 minutes and then 30 with the commercials. 
And then at the end of a Scooby-Doo episode, the mystery is solved. The, the mystery machine shows up, and there's always some ghoul or goblin or ghost or monster. And then at the end of it, that the person is revealed, and the mystery is revealed at the end. And I would have gotten away with it, too, if it wouldn't have been for you rotten kids and really dog. You know, all that stuff. Every episode. It's the same thing. And at the end of the episode, the mystery is revealed. It's, it's not that way with communion. Like, at the end of the communion, everything is understood. The mystery of communion is something that we receive believing that there is much more available to us, much more than we'll ever be able to comprehend this side of heaven. That no matter how meaningful we understand it as being today, that our limited understanding holds no comparison to what it truly means. It has real value, which we get to experience, even as we don't fully grasp it. We still get the experience. We don't have to know what it is. We still get the experience. And it remains quite mysterious as it is a part of God's ways being higher than our ways. You may remember me uh, showing you the scripture in previous sermons. God's ways are higher than our ways. This is a sacrament instituted of Jesus Christ himself. And it was based on a meal that God created for protection of the Israelites coming out of Egypt in the Old Testament. This has very much everything to do with God offering something to us. In communion, we get to partake of the divine, though we can't even fully recognize it. See, sacraments are sign acts. These sign acts include words, actions, and physical elements, which both express and convey the gracious love of God, making his love visible and effective. In any sacrament, God uses tangible, ordinary, material things as vehicles, as instruments or means of grace, using the ordinary to, be, to bring about the extraordinary, using the temporal world to envisage the internal. Therefore, what we might, we might even say that sacraments are like God offering us a show and tell. You'll remember what show and tell is. Kids bring something to show the rest of the class and then tell them about it. The teacher uses these ways to communicate a larger and a broader concept, something that children would otherwise struggle to understand. That's what show and tell offers the youngsters. Likewise, the sacrament of communion is, is one means God communicates with us in a way, despite all our brokenness and limitations, despite what we can't understand, that we can still receive and experience God's grace. Further, Holy Communion is remembrance and commemoration and memorial. But this Remembrance is much more than simply an intellectual recalling of something, the recalling of, you, you do remember that this happened somewhere in the past, right? That's not what this is. It's much, much more than that. This phrase, do this in remembrance of me, is not merely words that get repeated, but a dynamic action, because in communion we offer a representation of God's past gracious acts. Note that it is a representation, not a representation. Our communion today doesn't merely represent what took place, but recreates it, represents it powerfully, anew and afresh to us today, so as to make God's gracious acts today truly present, to bring our awareness of God's actions today. This action of remembrance calls to mind, too, that, that Christ is risen which means he is alive here and now, not just remembered for what was done in the past, that he rose, but that he is risen. So it is a remembrance, but also a reminder that God continues to be up to something even now. Not only does communion represent the past and proclaim God's grace in the present moment, but it as well offers a, a foretaste of the future, a pledge of heaven, until Christ comes in his final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet, you may have heard before in our communion liturgies that phrase. Yeah, what is that? What does that mean? Feast at his heavenly banquet. What are we talking about? Well, Christ himself looked forward to this occasion after his resurrection when he promised the disciples, I will never again drink this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And all those scriptures on the screen, those references where you find those words. When we eat and drink the sacrament today, we become partakers in this life for life eternal. Each time we remember, which is past, 
we are presently also anticipating the heavenly banquet in the future where the foretaste of this meal will be culminated in the celebration of God's victory over sin and evil and death. Jesus discusses that directly in, in Matthew 22, as well as John in Revelation 21. So celebrations of Holy Communion are therefore a foretaste of the reign of God Almighty, moments when God's future breaks into our present world. That is precisely what took place at Jesus' resurrection, a moment when eternity pierced the veil to be revealed in the present. Friends, whether you've known it or understood it, any of this before, or even if you have still no idea what I'm talking about right now, these claims of the sacrament of communion have been true every time you participated, which is why John Wesley would have jumped at the chance to receive communion as often as he did, and why he would have encouraged us to do the same. This is also why Paul was so discouraged by the church in Corinth from our New Testament reading this morning. The people there were not realizing the mysterious beauty of this meal at which the death of Jesus is remembered, past, with all the present implications of that and, and what that had implications for their eternal life. Paul was explaining to them that their behavior at the meal betrayed their stated intentions. Picking up at verse 20, he said, When you meet together, you are not really interested in the Lord's Supper. For some of you, hurry to eat your own meal without sharing with others. As a result, some go hungry while others get drunk. What? Don't you have your own homes for eating and drinking? Or do you really want to disgrace God's church and shame the poor? Skipping down to verse 26, For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until He comes again. So, Anyone who eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. It's at this point that many people misunderstand Paul's comments here. It would appear that Paul is saying that certain persons may be unworthy to receive the sacrament. The fact is we are all unworthy, therefore worthiness alone cannot be all that, that Paul is alluding to here. Wesley helps us understand more fully what Paul is saying from his sermon called The Duty of Constant Communion. In that sermon Wesley preached, you are unworthy to receive any mercy from God, but is that a reason for refusing all mercy? God offers you a pardon for all your sins, you are unworthy of it, tis sure, and he knows it. But since he is pleased to offer it nonetheless, will you not accept it? He offers to deliver your soul from death. You are unworthy to live, but will you therefore refuse life? He offers to endue your soul with new strength. Because you are unworthy of it, will you deny to take it? Since the command of our Lord Jesus is, do this in remembrance of me, that's a command, that's an imperative, not a suggestion. Since that's the command, even if you don't partake as you understand yourself unworthy, John Wesley in the same sermon responds, what? Unworthy to obey God? Receiving communion is a command and choosing not to partake because of how unworthy you feel may be considered disobedience. But in direct response to those who are still concerned that 1 Corinthians 11 is talking about unworthy persons receiving communion, Wesley says that Paul's words referred not to the persons, but to the way the sacrament was consumed. When he says plainly, by eating and drinking unworthily is meant the taking of the holy sacrament in such a rude and disorderly way that one was hungry and another drunk. And to prove Wesley correct, I go back to verse 29. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. The problem in Corinth wasn't individual worthiness. It was their disdain, their lack of honor for the whole of the body of Christ, the church. The same church which is intended to benefit from the sacrament by remembering the past, having relevance in the present, and which offers a foretaste of God's victorious future for all His people, not just for the wealthy or for those who arrived first, which is how they were doing it. 
Nevertheless, some of you still may balk at the idea of constant communion. That was Wesley's sermon, the duty of constant communion. Due to the functional difficulties of communion at every worship, every worship service. Are you sure? It takes up so much time. I'd rather hear a good sermon. As far as that goes, Pastor Scott can start any time. To those who reasonably see it that way, I ask, what if there were different ways to partake? What if, what if we mixed it up so that we can, it can continue to be meaningful? What if it doesn't have to be rote, even if it is routine? And my answer to my own questions actually begins with the words of Wesley, words that we've already seen. He said, whenever opportunity serves, use all the means which God has ordained. Whenever the opportunity serves, God's grace is ever flowing. And if it's brought to our attention that we can receive, take it whenever opportunity serves. Today happens to be one of those whenever opportunities. Except we're not going to do communion like we normally do. When Christ our Lord walked the earth, he found all were worthy to share food. Which is why the Lord's table in this church is open to everyone who is willing to confess and earnestly repent of their sins and who seek to live in peace with one another. In Jesus... God left all of the divinity, all of the glory of heaven and came to earth and lived among us. And in communion, God's grace is mysteriously conveyed as it is willingly offered. Since God did so much to be sure that we might receive his grace coming from heaven and coming down to us, communion today will be offered in a similar vein. Today, you will remain seated. And God's gracious elements will come to you, just as Jesus came to us and God's grace comes to us all. The elements will come to you. But before we receive those elements and some instruction, would you offer with me this short confessional prayer, which is already on the screen, that's all there is to it, and then we'll have a time of silent confession. Let's pray this prayer together. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. Friends, Christ died for us when we were sinners. That is proof of God's love despite our condition. So, let us proclaim together. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. On the night in which Christ our Lord gave himself up for us, he, he took the bread, gave thanks to God, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken and given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to God, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from, from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for the many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of what God in Christ has done, let us offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim together the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may become the body of Christ for the world, redeemed by his blood. And now let us pray the prayer of humble access. We do not presume to come to this, your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own unrighteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not priority to so much as gather up the crumbs from under your table. So we are same Lord, whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sins lives may be clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, 
and he in us. Amen. Friends, because there is one loaf, we who are one body all partake of the one loaf. That means the bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. And because we share it together, we're going to be doing things a little bit differently together in just a moment when the ushers prepare. But now as a unified body of Christ, let us gather at our Lord's table and, and partake of the gifts of God for the people of God. Take, him, take them in remembrance that he has died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. So in just a moment, our ushers will begin passing the elements down each row. The way I'd like for us to receive this morning, the ushers will come and get these small little cups which have crackers in them. The crackers are unleavened bread. That is kind of the, the way that uh, the disciples would have received the sacrament the first time in unleavened bread. And they will come and offer those down the road. When you receive that bread, you can take it immediately and eat it. So let me say these words. This is the, the body of Christ broken for you. And now you can receive it as soon as you get it. And then after they get through passing out the, the crackers, then they will come back and grab the trays of juice and they will pass those out separately. Now my hope is that you'll hold on to those cups and so that we can all take it together. There was someone in the last service who took it right when they got it. And you know what worked out? Everything. So if you do it wrong, there's nothing wrong with it. But I'd like for us to take it together. And so uh, at some point in time, the band will be playing and I may stop them. We'll take the blood of Christ together, uh, those who are available to do that. And then um, we'll move on with the song and then there'll be a closing prayer. Then the last thing the ushers will do, because they're busy today, they'll come back and grab the trash can because we don't have a place to put those cups. So they'll come back and grab a little receptacle and you'll be able to place those in before the service is over. So our, our ushers are doing double duty or quadruple duty actually today. And we thank them for their, their kind service to us. Receive these gracious elements of the Lord. We're going to be singing, Oh, come to the altar. But this morning, the altar of Christ is coming to you because that is the grace of our God. Let's lift our voices this morning.
Let's sing one verse of this song and then we'll take the cup together. This is God's cup of love. This is the blood of Christ shed to cover your sins. Amen. One more verse of that song, I think, over the third verse, and then we'll conclude with uh, standing in the benediction. Why don't you stand now as you can replace your cups in the pre uh, receptacles as they pass by. Let us lift our voices for our closing verse. guys did an excellent job of standing even though you were singing fall on my knees. I know it could have been confusing, but it's about our attitude of heart, not just our posture of body. All of it plays well together. As the Christ light is taken out by the acolytes to go before us in the world, let us pray as we conclude this service this morning. Father God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery of communion in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Empower us to go forth in grace and in peace, to love God and love our neighbors as you've taught us to love ourselves. Amen. Have a great week, everyone. A wonderful Veterans Day uh, weekend celebration. And don't forget to thank an usher.